So my name is Luca Weiss. Uh, I'm Android Platform Engineer at Fairphone. Uh, and also in my free time, I'm open source maintainer and contributor for several projects such as PostMarketOS, uh, Linux Kernel, and OpenRazor. And you can find me on Mastodon. So, uh, quick facts about Fairphone. Um, so we were funded, uh, or we were founded in 2013. Uh, we started as an NGO and winners campaign. Uh, you can hear about all of this uh, quite a bit later um, at our uh, with, uh, the talk with Agnes at uh, 2 p.m. Um, but yeah, we do fair electronics, so mostly smartphones, but also some accessories for the smartphones and some audio products as of lately. Um, our head, head office is in Amsterdam, uh, but we also have some employees in, uh, in China and in Taiwan. And yeah, we have over 140 people working for us. So, um, what is Linux? Um, uh, the, yeah, the Linux kernel is a... Give me a second. I need to also see it here. So, uh, yeah, it's an operating system kernel. Um, so it's kind of the basis uh, between the, the hardware and user space, so kind of all of the applications and all of the system things that are running on the, uh, on the device. Uh, Linux itself is running on most servers in the world, so kind of most of the, uh, all of the web servers basically that, are, uh, that you use daily, uh, they're running Linux. A lot of embedded hardware is using Linux uh, as the kernel, and also every single Android phone in the world, so over one billion devices uh, are running Linux. Um, yeah, as I said, it kind of provides a layer between the, the user space um, and the hardware, so kind of the, yeah, the, there's also a thing called kernel space, but it's kind of the, the, the stuff or the, the code running in the kernel itself. Uh, but yeah, it kind of user space everything on top. Um, yeah, the Linux kernel provides also a bunch of like process scheduling, memory management, etc. cetera. Uh, but um, yeah, mostly kind of talking about kind of the things that interact with different hardware components uh, on, the, on the device, especially. So Linux on laptops is easy. You can basically take any laptop. You can take Ubuntu, ISO, or any other Linux distribution. Um, and you can basically install it, and you can run it, and basically most of the things will work. There might be some, some gotchas here and there uh, if the hardware is not uh, well supported yet, but for the most part, it will just work. Uh, you don't need like a thousand extra patches on top of the kernel to, to have it working. Um, but so, so why are phones um, complicated then? Well, um, so a lot of the, the, I think a lot of the reasons why phone hardware is quite differently and, and doesn't work as well um, without, or basically with mainland Linux, so kind of the upstream version, um, is kind of extra power savings. Um, so they, um, there's a lot of extra things that need to be done by the kernel to actually make the hardware work and to be able to talk with the hardware. Um, so, for example, um, there's a bunch of reset GPIOs, so kind of where you first need to toggle a GPIO, so kind of a high-low um, state, to actually be able to talk to the device. Uh, and on a laptop, basically everything that is, that is on the device um, is, uh, is already discoverable, for example, on USB or PCI. Um, yeah, of course, also there's um, yeah, kind of a, uh, a lot of the components that are connected, they are not using like a standard protocol. So for example, on a, on a laptop, you have a USB webcam, basically, um, that is integrated. And this is using a very standard uh, USB um, protocol. To, uh, to talk camera, um, but for phones, um, all of this is quite a bit more kind of uh, lower level, which is, I think is also uh, a, one of the reasons for power savings. Um, that's, there's not a lot of extra kind of more high performance uh, chips on the system that draw a lot of power, uh, but it's only kind of the, the main SOC that is handling these kind of things. Of course, there's also a bunch of extra hardware that isn't present on, on a laptop. So, I mean, touchscreens are a thing on laptops nowadays. Uh, but of course, you have vibration motors, sensors, um, a lot of cameras, extra random buttons, etc. And of course, with phones, you also need voice over LTE um, and, and a lot of other things for actually doing phone calls. And of course, also the other 2, uh, 2G, 3G phone call things. So um, let's talk a bit about kind of the um, how um, on, uh, how the Linux kernel lands on Android devices. So um, Linux itself is being developed on kernel.org and being released there every couple of months. Um, most of you or many of you are running this on your computer if you uh, if you have Linux installed. Um, then every year one of these versions gets selected as an LTS, so a long-term support release. Uh, this gets supported between kind of six years and two years. Um, they're slowly moving to a two-year. Um, um, support model uh, because of yeah uh, difficult reasons, 
Um, based on this LTS branch that is released upstream by kernel.org, um, Google creates an Android common kernel branch, the ACK branch. Um, for example, an Android 11 5.4 branch. This is kind of the 5.4 kernel version um, meant for devices that are launching with Android 11. Then based on this branch that is being created by Google, the SOC manufacturer takes this, adds some support of, um, uh, for their SOC on top, and then finally the device manufacturer gets, uh, gets this code base and can, um, yeah, and can put their device-specific changes on top of this. And kind of this also means um, yeah, by the time a device launches, the kernel is already multiple years old. And it's never really updated because, the, the, I mean, while uh, mainline and the LTS branches are moving forward or the new, new ones are created, um, and also and Google is really cr um, creating new uh, kernel version branches, the SOC, the SOC manufacturers practically never updates the kernel version um, for, a, um, yeah, for an SOC, so the device manufacturer can also never really update it. So let's look a bit about kind of the, the Linux kernel that is shipping on Fairphone devices. Uh, so with uh, both Fairphone 1 and Fairphone 2, so uh, devices launched in 2013 and 2015, we were running Linux 3.4, which was released in 2012. So already kind of, yeah, you see Fairphone 2 was released in 2015. The kernel version running on it was released in 2012. But we actually managed to get uh, even up to Android 10 running uh, on the device Android 11. Uh, also, for example, in Linux, this would work. Uh, with Fairphone 3, I have, some, uh, I have some nicer numbers here. Um, it is running Linux 4.9 which was released in December 2016. Uh, and uh, on the Linux stable branch, kind of, so where there's some upstream maintenance happening, uh, it became end of life in January 20, 2023. So since then, we, uh, we, have to have, uh, we have to do more work to actually backport some patches to the, to the kernel version. Um, and kind of, uh, it's a problem here, because with Android uh, 13, it was still supported, this kernel version. But with Android 14, it's just not supported anymore from Google side. And they're requiring some new kernel features that are not present in the 4.9 kernel. And kind of the, the, the code that we got from, uh, from Qualcomm, it's about 2.5 million lines of, uh, of difference compared to the 4.9 version that's being released upstream. And it's about 18,000 commits. So this also shows kind of why it's basically uh, not really possible for a device manufacturer to rebase all of these 2.5 million lines and make them work because a lot of uh, a lot of it's also patching quite core uh, core kernel subsystems, which of course change upstream also. Uh, with Fairphone 4, uh, it's uh, and the other device it's kind of the same story, um, either for the, uh, kernel 4.19 or kernel 5.4. With I mean you can see the numbers are going down a bit uh, in terms of, uh, of in terms of how many commits and how many uh, lines of uh, lines of code. But uh, these are also actually excluding some uh, external kernel modules, um, so the things they call tech pack. Uh, and things like Wi-Fi driver, they, these are external kernel modules and are not actually in, this, uh, in these numbers. Uh, but yeah, even for the Fairphone 5, which uh, was released um, only a few months ago, um, the kernel is end of life in two years, because yeah, the kernel version was already released in November 2019. But this is what the SOC manufacturer provides, and this is basically what a device manufacturer has to go with. So yeah, there's, um, of course, yeah, it's not great to run these old kernels. Um, as I mentioned, um, AOSP will, um, is dropping support for these kernel versions sort of aggressively because, yeah, I mean, they're also kind of sick with supporting these old kernels that don't support any, uh, any of the features that they want to use. Um, of course, if you're stuck on the same kernel version all the time, uh, you don't get any new features because uh, Linux is getting a lot of great new features. Um, of course, if you're stuck on the same version, <laughs> you don't get it. Um, there's also some concerns about security because, yeah, if you're running the same kernel uh, or in, in a six-year-old kernel, um, it's questionable kind of also how many people, even for the Linux stable um, branch that's being released, like how many people are actually running this, how many people are testing this, um, how many people are looking at this for security issues. Um, I think most, most security uh, researchers are looking kind of at the newest releases because this is what is generally used and don't really focus on the old ones. Uh, a problem also with the vendor kernels is that you can't really have a 100% open source user space um, because a lot of the kernel drivers are using non-standard interfaces or um, some, um, some interface that only works with their specific proprietary user space uh, counterpart. Um, and also, yeah, because you can't have uh, a 100% open source user space, um, yeah, there's some concerns about security and privacy uh, because, you, yeah, as an end user, you can't know what the code is actually doing. 
Um, so yeah, what's the alternative? Well, you can try and push the device support upstream into the mainline kernel, so uh, to the newest version that is being released all the time. Kind of what uh, what laptops, yeah, what you're running on laptops. Um, so how does the mainline kernel development look for for mobile devices, especially? Um, so it, it's it's quite a good community of people working together. Um, they um, yeah, working on uh, mostly smartphones, but also some other mobile devices such as tablets or even smartwatches. Um, the community development, uh, so kind of uh, the, yeah, the, the groups of people, they are mostly grouped by SOC, so kind of the system on a chip. Uh, so for example, for the uh, Snapdragon 410, there's the MSM8916 um, group, um, where they're um, maintaining uh, um, some extra patches that are currently being upstreamed or are um, still a bit work in progress, but generally working. Um, so also some unfinished work, so yeah, where, where it's not ready yet, and also some hacks that might be needed um, for this specific, or for some devices there. Uh, but this is kind of generally what, uh, what uh, we call kind of close to mainline, so kind of where it's basically the mainline kernels, so for example, version 6.6, .6, the newest version, plus, I don't know, maybe like a 50 patches, 100 patches, or something along the line, but kind of what is uh, all the time rebased to the newest version. Yeah, this is also kind of how volunteer communities organize. Um, uh, companies probably do some, probably have a similar system, but uh, yeah, I don't really have too much, um, yeah, too much knowledge there. Um, except, yeah, I know how how I uh, I also do this kind of similar, kind of have a tree per uh, per SOC because makes quite a, makes it quite a bit easier. So let's look at the, the mainline support for uh, different Fairphone devices. So we start with Fairphone One, released in 2013. Um, this is all of the device-specific um, code that there is. Um, basically, nothing works. Uh, you can get a, a shell on UART that's basically int. Um, not even uh, multiple cores work, so only one core gets enab enabled instead of the four cores. Um, but there was kind of a fun, fun proof of concept to kind of run mainline on this really, really old device. Um, Fevin 2 was kind of the device where I, where I started um, in my free time um, doing some mainlining. So I started a thing in 2017. Um, working on this, as was before I joined Fairphone also. Um, yeah, so uh, we, we have a, a good amount of features working uh, on the latest uh, kernel versions. So kind of, yeah, UART, so kind of the very low level um, debug output and input. Uh, the, the power and volume buttons uh, uh, you can press and you get key events uh, in the in user space. Uh, yeah, USB, internal storage and SD card. Touchscreen is working only with the new display module because there have been two different dif display modules with two different touchscreen ICs. Um, so currently only the, the new one is supported in mainline. Um, notification LLD, so you can see when you get a notification, for example. Um, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, the ADSP, which is kind of a uh, co-processor for, um, for basically audio and few sensor stuff. Uh, but yeah, uh, you can talk to it. Uh, there's not really much kind of uh, open source user space that actually can talk to it. Uh, modem is working, so in theory you can do phone calls, but as you see on the right side, audio is not working, so phone calls are kind of useless uh, if you can't talk to anyone. Um, battery charge is working, so um, yeah, you can actually, when you plug it in, it's sort of decently um, put, some, yeah, put some current to the battery. Vibration motor, and you can kind of tell the device to reboot into the bootloader, which is also a special feature. Um, extra working functionality, yeah, we have display and GPU working. Um, this is not upstream. I could probably upstream this, uh, haven't bought it so far, because uh, this is also a bit tricky with the two different display modules, which have two different panels. Um, so yeah. Um, and yeah, kind of, yeah, what, what's my, more interesting, in my opinion, is kind of what isn't working. Uh, yeah, audio, as I said, um, quite a lot of people have spent some time on, uh, on this, trying to get it working, but haven't succeeded uh, because of Basically, yeah, I will, I will talk about this a bit later. Uh, battery fuel gauge, so you can't know how much percentage is in your battery, which is a bit annoying because you don't know if, if you're running it on battery, that's, yeah, you don't know if it's going close to zero. Uh, camera is not working, uh, flash and torch LED. Uh, sensors, which is mostly a, uh, a user space thing. There, there, have been, there has been some progress lately um, in the last year, um, but not working yet. And video and uh, enc decoder, encoder and IMMU is not working. For Fevin 3, it's quite a similar story. Uh, we have we have a good number of features uh, supported, so touchscreen, reboot, reason, notification, LED, NFC, even. Um, we also have yeah, kind of the similar functionality uh, working, but it's not upstream yet. I'm currently also working a bit on this, and some other people in this uh, in the SOC community are working on this. 
And yeah, to be honest, uh, the missing completely sections are also quite similar. Uh, we, yeah, we again don't have battery fuel gauge, we don't have sensors, we don't have the camera, we don't have fingerprint sensor, which is new on that device. Um, Fathom 4, um, looking a bit better on the, on kind of what is really fully upstream. Um, also, yeah, kind of with the, with kind of what is in the, in my own repository. It's, it's kind of decent support, it works well enough, but yeah, again, on what is missing, I think by now you, you, you start to see a pattern, what is missing. Um, and 5.5 is actually sort of decent-ish. Um, there, there's some new things uh, working, for example, video decoding, encoding, the battery and charger status is working. And this is only two months after launch with the latest kernel version 6.6, plus about 100 patches. Uh, most of them are currently being upstreamed. Um, uh, some already landed in the upcoming 6.7 release, and I think some will go into 6.8. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm confident uh, that a good chunk of this will actually go upstream quite soon. Um, but yeah, in the missing completely section, we also see kind of, yeah, modem. Um, there's, some, there's some issue there. Audio is not working, camera is not working, vibration motor is not working, NFC, fingerprint sensor, etc. So I think by now you kind of see a pattern. Um, I, I, I would say kind of this, um, the, the missing features can be grouped into three different categories. Kind of the ones where it was never really implemented in the first place, or n no one really ever implemented this properly. Uh, so fingerprint, camera, sensors. Uh, this is not working on any device, basically. For camera, there's a few, uh, there's a few, there's a few exceptions. Um, there's some features that are not really, that, that are not very often implemented upstream uh, by kind of the, these volunteers. So this includes audio and NFC, where kind of also the knowledge is missing uh, for especially NFC and camera in the, in the previous section. Um, there's also kind of the user space is lacking, so kind of there's not really applications to use this with or even to test it with properly. Um, this is kind of a, a problem like yeah, the, the user space, uh, the, the kind of the people that would work on, for example, a, a camera app, they don't have uh, any phone that supports the camera stack. But uh, the kernel people, they, um, yeah, they can't really make support for it if they can't really test it well. Uh, so it's also kind of a problem there. Um, there's also um, a few complicated drivers, uh, which, which are, yeah, it, which is super tricky to understand because there's a lot of magic going on there, uh, which especially includes battery charge and fuel gauge. For battery charge, it's probably not that magic, but um, yeah, you don't really want to drive uh, too much current to the battery and potentially have a safety hazard there. Uh, so people generally also avoid working on that. Kind of why these drivers are missing, I would say kind of um, um, uh, some people working kind of professionally on, uh, um, professionally full-time on this. Uh, they are mostly working on dev boards such as this, so this is a Qualcomm robotics board. Um, and yeah, as you can see, these, this doesn't have a camera, it doesn't have a fingerprint sensor, it doesn't have, um, doesn't have NFC, it doesn't have a lot of things that a phone does have and kind of what is also in, the, in the, my list here. Um, at the same time, kind of the volunteers don't really have an understanding for, um, or it is very difficult to get an understanding for a lot of these, uh, a lot of these topics without actually having any documentation because the documentation is very confidential um, and so normal people can't access it. Yeah, as I said, user space lacking integration, um, so it is, yeah, difficult to develop. And there's also easier topics to work on. So most people volunteering their time um, don't have infinite time, of course. Um, so kind of, yeah, simpler topics such as getting the screen working are preferred compared to, I don't know, getting camera working because, yeah, what good is a camera if you can't display anything here? I've heard a few times kind of, oh yeah, I, I, I don't need all this fancy functionality like, um, I don't know, camera, etc. I just want a working phone. I want, I want to have a phone call, I want to write some SMS, I want to maybe send an MMS because, I don't know. Um, but actually, phone calls are kind of one of the more tricky things technically, um, because yeah, you need a lot of you need kind of yeah, you need the modem support. You need to talk to the modem, um, have all of this uh, working, speaker support, um, which is different from microphone support. Um, these are uh, normally qu uh, two different ways to kind of yeah do audio. Um, but you also need all of the audio routing set up. So um, if you use a normal phone, you expect a lot of different things to work. You expect to be able to use the earpiece and the microphone normally. You expect it to put on speakerphone, where you then use the main speaker and a different microphone. Uh, maybe you want to use Bluetooth headphones for doing a phone call. Maybe you want to pl plug in USB-C analog headphones or using the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. Um, or you use USB-C dig digital microphones. So there's a lot of different use cases that really need to be supported um, 
for kind of things, these things to work as someone would expect. And of course, this doesn't, doesn't even cover voice over LTE and voice over 5G, which is, um, which is a completely different topic and emergency calls and whatever. And yeah, um, there's also random other functionality like SIM toolkit and things that, that some people in some countries need because their, op their provider does something with it. Yeah, uh, it's a lot of things to get working, so yeah. So what is kind of the, the goal of doing this mainlining? So um, from our side, I would say, definitely say kind of longevity in any case. I mean, so we have problems at Fairphone with the old kernel and switching to a mainline kernel, being able to update it would solve kind of the, this issue. And of course, we, all, we also wouldn't be stuck on, on this old kernel version. Currently where we can, um, we are quite used to updating the Android part uh, so getting Android, ver uh, getting Android to a new version, sort of come to Android 13 or Android 14, uh, but still with the kernel, it is yeah we have we yeah it is quite an untough topic for us. With actually having mainline, quite a few possibilities open up. So um, yeah, you're not tied to these proprietary binaries anymore uh, that are needed for some functionality. Uh, you can replace them with open source user, sp uh, user space parts. So for example, the GPU driver you can replace with Mesa and use, uh, use FreeDrainer there and even have Vulkan support, etc. Um, but you could also, for example, run Android with proprietary binaries. So for example, for a camera, um, it, is, um, it is a very difficult topic uh, because it's, it's, a very, um, it's a very complicated um, thing to get the camera quality good. Uh, so kind of um, re uh, if you would reuse just, for example, the camera binaries, you would still have the rest open source, uh, but still um, still have some, basically keep some of the kind of better parts of the proprietary stack. Um, and also with mainline, you can run some other um, Linux-based operating systems, such as Postmarket or, or Mobian. Yeah, that's what I'm talking a bit. Um, so kind of, yeah, Postmarketers, which is one of the projects I'm involved in in my free time, is kind of the tagline is a real Linux distributions for phones and, for phones and other mobile devices. Um, it is a 100% open source uh, operating system for phones. Uh, we don't reuse the, the Android parts because, yeah, most of them are proprietary and are pretty bad code quality in general. Um, yeah, we can support a lot of devices with this relatively easily with, uh, with minimal overhead because most of the code that is in the distribution is quite generic across all of the devices. Because if the kernel provides a proper interface, a standard interface, then user space doesn't have to be adapted for every single Android uh, or for every single device because the kernel is already abstracting uh, everything away, um, how it should be done. In Postmark Desk, we use standard Linux components, so we use Pulse Audio, we, we use uh, normal init systems, we use GCC for compiling, we use, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> basically what, what you find on a laptop distro, uh, distro also. We're quite upstream first, so we try to upstream all of the changes that we're doing to all of the components. So with Blue Z, if we have, uh, we, if we have some development there, we upstream it. And uh, this also kind of in the this upstream first uh, mentality, we are also collaborating with a few other projects such as Mobian, which is uh, Debian for mobile devices. Uh, currently, Postmarketers is mostly kind of for developers, for developers and for Linux, Linux enthusiasts. enthusiasts. Um, kind of for the people that actually want to run, I don't know, for example, Docker or Kubernetes on the phone, uh, or do a lot of other random Linux things, um, have root on your phone, why not? Um, but yeah. Um, so what would mainline kernel mean for longevity of the devices? Um, so yeah, of course it would mean we could actually update the kernel, get rid of this uh, old crappy version, uh, and go to a new version. Um, if we were running on mainline, um, and actually we could also easier update to new kernel versions, of course, uh, because it's just maybe, I don't know, I would say maybe like 100 patches. Um, and of course, these are a bit easier to rebase than 18,000 patches. Um, yeah, we wouldn't be hitting end of life of kernel versions. So here in this table, you can see kind of the, all of the stable versions that are currently being maintained with the end of life date on the right side. Um, so of course, if you update, you, you don't have to worry about this because you can just update to a new version and yeah, we get new features by doing this. Um, yeah, um, kind of the utopia that I would say for, um, for what I would uh, <laughs> and kind of my team would like um, is yeah, kind of yeah, basically on, on Android device up to, the, uh, up to the kernel version to a new ATS version, so long-term support re uh, release kind of once it's released or a bit after, and then never stay on the old version, because why should you? 
So for third-party software, um, I think if, if Fairphone devices would um, yeah would run on mainline, um, Linuxes and other Android ROMs wouldn't really have any problem with it because they can just update um, update to the new kernel, update the user space binaries, and I mean uh, they basically follow stock Android anyways. Um, shouldn't cause any extra issues. Um, Ubuntu Touch can basically do the same. Um, they use a thing called Halium, which is basically reusing. So Ubuntu Touch is a, also a kind of a open source Linux distribution for phones. Uh, but they're actually reusing the Android parts, so kind of the Android kernel and uh, um, some proprietary parts from it uh, to get the hardware functionality working. Um, alternative operating systems like Postmark and Mobian, uh, they can get kernel support, so it, basically the device will start working with those uh, quite easily. And even Ubuntu Touch, they could switch away from using the Android binaries, so with the Halium project, um, to actually ba basically also uh, going a bit closer to kind of what Postmark does, um, is doing. Um, yeah, uh, and even for third-party devices, if a specific SOC has good support upstream, uh, getting new devices working is quite easy. So this is also kind of why I, uh, why Fafn 5 is already working that great, because I didn't have to spend that much time on actually getting the SOC working, the base bits working, but I actually was just focused on kind of the, doing the device-specific things. So even yeah, even if another company would uh, were to produce a phone with the same SOC, they can. Um, somebody can just make it working relatively easily. So, kind of the future. Um, from, Fairfax, uh, from Fairfax side, it's definitely an R&D project. Uh, we are seeing what can be done. Uh, in any case, I think we will keep hacking on something like this, because uh, it's quite interesting and quite, uh, quite good to see what can be done. I, th I think um, I am confident that support will get better over time. I've already seen, I mean, you've already seen even just uh, the progression of kind of uh, Fafn 5 is working relatively nicely, and old devices are not, um, even though the old devices has had, have had a lot more development time on it. Uh, so SOC vendors and other other uh, component manufacturers are getting, I think, better. It is still far from perfect, um, but at least better, so we can see what's, uh, what's going on. But yeah, also kind of realistically, some components will really never really work great. So for example, you can actually see Fafn 2 uh, with camera support. Um, you can see it is, yeah, first of all, 90 degrees rotated. Um, it is very green. I needed to set the auto, the, the exposure, and the gain manually. There is basically, yeah, and you get some picture out of it. I mean, it, it looks like my room, kind of in a very messy state. Um, but yeah, kind of, yeah, it, it is getting better. So Fafn 5 is running uh, fully GPU accelerated, everything there. Um, and yeah, so far the most of the work being done on these devices is actually not really writing new drivers. So it's not a problem about writing new drivers. But there are already drivers upstream. But every SOC needs to have a slightly different, um, slightly different code paths for some components. Um, so it's really just about adapting the existing drivers, making some changes to them, and kind of figuring out why the hardware doesn't really want to work in the way that it does. Um, of course, there's also some device-specific things like the, the audio routing, but Phones are on the technical side or on a, on a um, yeah, from, from a kernel side, they're quite similar. There, there's always, there's a few I2C buses. For the most part, uh, the same components are connected to the same I2C buses. Uh, so it's not really too much variation from a kernel perspective. So once one device is working, it is quite a bit easier to get uh, another device working. So how you can run a mainline kernel, um, if you want to do this, uh, yeah, you can uh, install Postmark address, for example. Most devices that do have mainline, that have some amount of mainline support, do have a Postmark address port. Um, of course, also you can get started with uh, with mainlining. Um, I started basically from zero. Uh, it's some Linux knowledge that's quite useful, um, but otherwise, yeah, you just kind of work on it, figure things out over time. Um, I think by now there's quite a bit better documentation, also in the Postmark address wiki, uh, that documents a bunch of this stuff, and a lot of a lot more people know about kind of the uh, the, the weird things that need to be done for this. Having access to secret documents now working at Fairphone um, is definitely makes things easier. Um, uh, so normally, kind of yeah, schematics are um, are confidential data sheets and documentation. Schematics do make it easier, kind of, to build a device tree. So kind of this hardware description that the kernel needs, uh, because some some things are not really obvious from uh, the way that the that the, uh, that the vendor provided kernel is uh, has this written. Uh, data sheets do make it easier to write new drivers in case it's necessary. Um, also, some some uh, I have for schematics uh, for Fairphone 4 and hopefully soon Fairphone 5. We actually have the schematics public, so anybody can look at them. 
data sheets, yeah, as I said, they, might, they make it easier to write new drivers. Um, there, it's kind of a, a mix uh, between some some are proprietary, uh, some are confidential, some are actually public. So uh, for a few components, you can actually find a data sheet online uh, from the uh, from the manufacturer. And also having access to some documentation, it does make things easier to understand. Uh, but nothing of this um, should re uh, can uh, can really prevent you from learning about kind of yeah making support for this. Um, yeah, so for example, uh, with the schematics, um, it makes it quite a bit easier to kind of um, there's some regulators, so kind of power supplies that are getting triggered. They get um, a GPO line in, so kind of a high low, and some power in. And when uh, when the regulator gets switched to high, then the then a kind of a different voltage comes out the other end of the chip, and this is used quite a lot on on phones. Uh, but kind of normally the way the downstream kernel um, uh, interacts with this is not very obvious that there's actually kind of this hardware component on the board. And once you understand this, um, it makes it quite a bit easier to yeah, it makes quite a bit more sense, and you can actually write a proper device tree, device tree description for um, for the kernel. Um, it is possible to, to figure this out without schematics, especially if you have some uh, some uh, some yeah some experience with this. Uh, but yeah, schematics are nice. Yeah. So what should uh, device manufacturers do, uh, like Fairphone? So yeah, we should definitely uh, push suppliers. So Qualcomm. Um, the NFC vendors, the component manufacturers, or our touchscreen vendor to actually push their code and their drivers upstream, so we never really get into these uh, giant forks of the of Linux kernel. So with way too ma way too much code there. Um, of course, yeah, w you sh you can also show that it's actually possible. Show the uh, show the uh, show the component manufacturers, show even Qualcomm, hey, this is possible. Uh, you don't have to run this crappy old version. Um, but yeah, kind of somebody needs to uh, needs to start doing this. Uh, schematics, as I said, they are quite useful not not just for making Linux kernel, but mostly for repairability. So kind of knowing where the, where the different components are, so you can actually replace them and fix them. Um, some devices have them leaked from repair shops or something. So some random uh, websites do have some uh, some lying around. Uh, but of course, having them public for everyone to see would be quite a bit better. And there's nothing too, I mean, there's, no, there's nothing secret about the hardware because basically all of the phones kind of work in a similar way on a schematic level. Um, so I, yeah, I don't think it sh there should be a reason for this to be secret. Um, and yeah, uh, pushing all the code that you can and make it kind of uh, make it possible for people to dig through the code. Uh, would be nice. Uh, for Fairphone devices, um, we are pushing as much code as we can up, uh, uh, to open source to our website code.fairphone.com. Um, so for example, um, you can get the whole um, Fairphone 3 um, source tree. You can download it, build it yourself on your PC and flash it to the phone. And you basically get the same um, as, or a very similar build to kind of what we ship uh, with normal updates, uh, minus, some, uh, minus some proprietary components like Google services and Whitewine. Uh, for the for some proprietary uh, parts that we uh, that are needed to run a device, um, we actually provide them as binaries, so you can easily uh, get them and get them into your tree. Uh, but at least uh, the rest you can all build. Uh, for Fevn four and Fevn five, we can leave a bit of a different uh, code available there. Um, you can look at it, um, but uh, due to the way that the source tree is structured, you cannot actually build it. Unfortunately, hopefully this will change soon for Fevn four at least. Um, but yeah, at least until then. Uh, you can look at it, which is really nice. So, yeah, and that's it. Uh, thanks for listening, and time for questions. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, can you dual boot to the Fairphone, uh, like Fairphone 4 or 5, uh, by putting an SD card with like post-market OS and still uh, boot uh, to the, have the ability to boot also on the original Fairphone um, Android o OS? So the closest you can currently get um, is kind of so the Android devices, they, um, they have an A and a B slot. Uh, so uh, you can switch between them in the, from the bootloader. Um, you could. Um, Flash um, the postmarketer's boot image uh, to the B slot, 
and then the, then you can boot from that one, and it can find uh, um, the the root of S from the SD card, uh, and you can switch back to the A slot, and then the Android uh, ROM disk uh, starts and is loading the Android system, which is on the internal storage. This is working. Um, unfortunately, this also means kind of Android is exp um, would override the other partition when this uh, updates. Um, so kind of you would have to reflash the other boot image. You also cannot switch the slots from the bootloader, so you would actually need a, a PC or some other device to actually run like this fast boot set active um, A or fast boot set, set active B to switch between them. In theory, you can switch it from user space. Uh, so if you have an Andro uh, a rooted Android phone, you can I think you can switch it from Postmark you can also, also switch it. Uh, but yeah, it would be a bit error prone. I know at least one device they have um, implemented kind of support for switching the slot from the bootloader directly. And I know some people are using this to actually um, switch between them kind of without having an external, um, um, an external uh, computer. Uh, yeah, uh, I can, one more thing. Um, it is, yeah, so we are kind of stuck with the bootloader that also Qualcomm gives us. Uh, so yeah, it is. We cannot really be very flexible. It's like actually uh, booting the kernel from the SD card. Unfortunately, it's not it's not possible. Um, but so at least yeah, kernel from the internal storage it loads from the SD card. That works. Yeah. Uh, s thanks a lot for 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 this work for working in this direction. It's super useful for us. Uh, my question is uh, whether or not you you have ways to run uh, Android application. I'm especially uh, thinking about uh, your bank application, which is now uh, mandatory to validate online payments and so on. Uh, you mean Android on post like Android apps on Postmark does? Uh, on mainland. I mean if. If you had an Android build with mainline, I mean, just, just the kernel is different. Uh, wouldn't be a difference in that regard. Um, I know banking applications like um, SafetyNet and, and APIs like this to validate that the device is actually running securely. Uh, this wouldn't be a problem with, with mainline because there's not really a, a difference. It's kind of just that the, it's a thing that the device manufacturer is kind of asserting that kind of this device uh, or this, this, this operating system is secure. Um, on Postmark, you, uh, you can run Android apps uh, with, uh, uh, with a uh, project called Waydroid, which is running kind of Android services in a container, kind of, I think, an LXC container. Um, but yeah, when running directly Android on mainline, I don't see why it should be a problem, uh, except that, yeah, I mean, yeah, once the device is working fully, which hopefully it might be at some point, um, yeah, it should be possible. Thank you for your great talk. Uh, my question is, uh, when you design a new phone, do you take in account the components that you know are uh, well supported in a mainline uh, Linux kernel? For new, so new I'm, I'm not involved in the in the in the hardware development process, um, but I, I think I can basically say no right now. Um, from Qualcomm SoC side, um, it is we don't really have a wide selection of SoCs we can choose from. So we basically have to choose the one that fits the best. Um, Unfortunately, most of the Qualcomm SOCs, especially, I mean, so um, Linaro, which is a company working with Qualcomm, they're, they're supporting the highest end SOCs kind of when they're released. So maybe you've seen the news, the thing two, uh, a month ago or something. Uh, newest Qualcomm SOC was announced and was basically uh, day one, they, uh, they got some support into, uh, they pushed some support upstream. Uh, unfortunately, it's not happening for kind of any other um, SOC line that's not the high end. So kind of, yeah, the, the Qualcomm has a lot of chips. Uh, most of them are not supported. Fortunately, their chips are not too different, uh, but they're different enough to to need kind of yeah this uh, per SOC support. Um, for other components, I think kind of the better path would be kind of to actually yeah, I mean as I said kind of push component manufacturers to actually um, to actually include this um, um, to include the support there. Um, because then also, of course, other manufacturers or other other people with devices with the same uh, with the same uh, component would then be able to use the driver without needing to uh, needing to resort to some other driver. From my limited research, I found that some uh, manufacturers, for example, uh, Librem, Star Labs, Pinephone, and I think even some Pixel phones have good support for for um, Linux uh, builds. Um, and so my question is, are those devices using mainline builds or are they using some quirks from uh, post-market OS or, or whatever? And 
if they're using mainline, would it be possible to use such components from those devices in the Fairphones? So both Librem 5 and the Pinephone, they are using, um, so Librem 5 is using the IMX um, as a chip from, I think, NXP. Um, Pinephone is using all winner, uh, an all winner chipset. So both not kind of chips that are commonly used in phones, in smartphones. Uh, so I think most, I mean, most kind of higher end smartphones are using Qualcomm. There's some lower end smartphones using MediaTek. Um, of course, yeah, Huawei, I think, has their Kirin uh, chip, a chip line. Samsung has their Exynos. Uh, but for the most part, kind of any other manufacturers using either Qualcomm or MediaTek um, because they are kind of the, yeah, the vendors that are doing, um, that are doing smartphone SOCs. Um, I wouldn't say the both the All Winner and IMAX is not suitable for mobile phones because yeah it it it's working and even the Fairphone 5 is running in theory a, uh, a an IoT chipset so one kind of more destined for some embedded product somewhere um, but it is actually also I mean they, they have the same feature set um, as kind of the uh, very similar um, Snapdragon kind of more phone SoC that they have. Um, but I think uh, also for both uh, Pinephone and Libum 5, um, I believe, for example, touchscreen, they it still needed to add, uh, someone needed to, uh, needed to add support for it. Uh, of course, with Libum 5, there's a bunch of people working full time on this. So this obviously means it's quite a bit, uh, it goes quite a bit better. And I think also the SOC was already supported relatively well upstream before they even started with the, with the device. Uh, Pinephone, there's, um, there's a community of people working on this. Um, Pine64 itself is not working on any software support, basically, so they're just relying on community people. And there it's also, it's not a, so if you really just run the, the, um, the, main, the mainline kernel from kernel.org without any extra patches on the Pine phone, um, most things I don't think are working because, um, because there's a lot of extra functionality being developed, kind of, yeah, also this kind of close to mainline mentality. Uh, but I think there, there it's less being pushed upstream. So it's, yeah, even after I think Pinephone has been out for three years now or something, and there's still a lot of, um, a lot of things that are sort of working upstream, but not, not well, because yeah, support hasn't been added. Yeah, so you already um, partially answered this question, but I was wondering about the bootloader situation. Um, so Qualcomm has been known for like decades to be very aggressive in terms of like enforcing secure boot on the first stage loader. Um, as far as I know, there's not, no real like U-boot support or anything like that. Uh, do you know if like there's some efforts in that direction, if someone's looking at that or working on that or anything like this? And, and if the secure boot thing is like still the same for the new chips or if they change something? Or yeah, so kind of in the in the Android boot chain, at least in Qualcomm devices, there's kind of two levels of signing and verifying. I would I would say. Uh, so kind of the, the um, so there's the kind of the, the very first bootloader kind of in the boot ROM where, which can't be modified. Um, this one um, there's some uh, Eve users on the device. So kind of where the, the where public key gets burned into the device, you cannot change it. Um, and then the, the primary bootloader, um, or the boot ROM, is verifying the next stage uh, based the designs on this, um, yeah, ba with this key. Um, then we get to the XBL, which is proprietary, and to the ABL, which is the uh, XBL is extensible bootloader, ABL is Android bootloader. Um, ABL is actually open source, it is uh, built, built on EDK2. Uh, so XBL is kind of providing a UEFI environment, as far as I understand, and ABL is running on top of that. Um, and then from this uh, from this on, um, kind of from this uh, from the ABL, it's uh, Android ver Android verified boot. Um, the reason, kind of why, um, or at, at least the way that it's currently done, is kind of um, the uh, the all the primary uh, or the the early boot components are signed with this uh, kind of by the OEM key, uh, because there's not really any other way to kind of um, ensure kind of the uh, kind of a trusted boot from kind of the, the beginning to kind of Android running. Um, there's some work being done recently on uh, getting U-boot support for Qualcomm devices. Um, I think somebody at Linaro is looking at this. Um, but it's also, I think, tricky there to kind of ensure kind of the, I mean, so phones are expected to be very secure by now, at least on a theoretical perspective. Uh, so it is expected that the banking app can kind of assert that the device is, in, uh, is, is reasonably secure and it has not been tampered with. Um, and I think once you kind of start opening up the early boot chains, it basically can do whatever it wants and can also pretend that it's actually secure. Um, I think banks especially wouldn't like this, etc. 
Uh, I'm not exactly sure to what extent Google is requiring stuff like this. Um, but yeah, kind of for, yeah, there's a lot of reasons there. Um, I wish it was different uh, because obviously, for example, even on the uh, M1 MacBooks or M2, um, they have figured out a way to kind of uh, be quite a bit more open with uh, signing uh, third-party operating systems or where you can sign a third-party operating system and actually boot it in a secure way. Um, the same, by the way, could be applied to iPhones also because it's the same chip. Uh, they don't do it there. Um, I think it could also be applied the same way to, to Android phones, to Qualcomm phones. Um, I don't know why they don't do it. Probably because it's not really, I guess, business demand or customer, de uh, customer demand as in, uh, as in manufacturers really going there and saying, hey, we want this. Yeah, it, it's tricky. I wish it was different. Any more questions? How much leverage does Fairphone have on manufacturers to force them, to kind of force them to publish everything upstream? Probably not too much because we don't buy enough from them. So of course, if we were to buy, I don't know, 10 million touchscreen ICs, they would probably reconsider. Um, I mean, so Fairphone is currently yeah, selling about 100,000 phones a year, kind of on uh, plus minus. Um, so it is not a lot for uh, for the industry. Of course, if you go to smaller manufacturers, they probably are, uh, are more looking at this. Um, but I, I think in general, like um, I think most of these manufacturers just don't do it because they don't see any customer demand. So I think if you would show some customer demand, so kind of saying like, hey, you you should upstream your driver, uh, then they might actually just do it because yeah, kind of yeah, uh, then. Businesses are, are buying their products, uh, but if if the customers are happy enough with the with the other driver that they are supplying, um, yeah, they might they just not don't do it because yeah, there's no no financial reason kind of to do it. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of the. <laughs> I guess if there's no more questions, thanks for listening. And yeah, you uh, you can see uh, a talk by Agnes and me at two in the big room, I think. Um, yeah, we are talking about Fairphone and some other, uh, yeah, quite a bit more kind of what we're doing in terms of mining and everything there. Thanks.